Israel says UN deceiving world over aid delays to Gaza. The situation regarding aid delivery to Gaza is contentious, with the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres observing blocked relief trucks at the Rafah crossing, prompting accusations from Israel that the UN is hindering aid delivery. There's a dispute over who is responsible for the aid blockages, with the UN citing screening procedures and limited operating hours at crossings. While Israel claims there are no limits on aid entering Gaza, Concerns are raised about Hamas manipulating aid distribution for political gain, and challenges include looting by local gangs. Israeli military involvement in aid distribution is increasing, with acknowledgement of distribution challenges and efforts to address them. The State Department emphasizes the need for Israel to improve humanitarian assistance into Gaza. Israel agrees to reschedule delegation visit to the White House, U.S. official. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu initially cancelled his delegation's visit to the White House after the U.S. abstained from a U.N. Security Council resolution calling for a humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza. However, Netanyahu has agreed to reschedule the visit, focusing on discussions about Rafah. The U.S. and Israel are working to find a new date for the meeting. The decision to reschedule follows constructive discussions between Israel's defense minister and several members of President Biden's cabinet in Washington, D.C. Netanyahu insists that a victory against Hamas requires IDF action in Rafah. The White House expresses concerns about civilian casualties in any IDF operation in Rafah, while the Israeli military plans to direct displaced Palestinians to humanitarian zones ahead of any potential invasion. Protecting Palestinians A Moral Imperative Pentagon chief tells Israeli counterpart. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin stressed the importance of protecting Palestinian civilians in the conflict between Israel and Hamas, emphasizing the dire humanitarian situation in Gaza. He met with Israel's Defense Minister Yov Gallant, urging increased humanitarian aid flow to Gaza. Gallant emphasized strong U.S.-Israeli ties but affirmed Israel's commitment to countering Hamas. Despite tensions over a cancelled visit by Netanyahu's aides and U.S. abstention on a U.N. ceasefire resolution, Austin expressed readiness to discuss alternative approaches to targeting Hamas in Gaza's southern city of Rafah. Both sides affirmed the unshakable security bond between the U.S. and Israel. Victory in Gaza only weeks away, says Netanyahu as he courts support for Rafah offensive. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel informed the U.S. bipartisan delegation that victory against Hamas in their ongoing conflict was imminent, insisting on launching a ground offensive into Rafah, a city in Gaza. Despite international concerns and U.S. skepticism, Netanyahu emphasized the necessity of achieving victory, defining it as the destruction of Hamas military capabilities. Release of Israeli hostages, and ensuring Gaza no longer poses a threat. He refuted claims of a humanitarian crisis, stating displaced Palestinians could find shelter elsewhere in Gaza. Netanyahu sought bipartisan support for the offensive, comparing it to decisive actions in past conflicts. He acknowledged U.S. opposition but affirmed Israel's willingness to act alone if necessary. The conflict, initiated by Hamas, has resulted in significant casualties on both sides. With Israel responding with ongoing military operations. The U.S. delegation included members from both parties, indicating a bipartisan interest in the issue. Israeli strikes on Rafah raise fear ground assault could begin. Israel conducted airstrikes in Rafah, Gaza, causing casualties and raising fears of an imminent ground assault. One strike killed 11 members of a single family, while another killed four Palestinians, including a woman and a child. Israel intensified its airstrikes following a UN Security Council resolution demanding an immediate ceasefire, prompting concerns of a humanitarian disaster. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu threatened a ground assault on Rafah despite US warnings. Meanwhile, violence escalated in the Israeli-occupied West Bank, with three Palestinians killed during an Israeli raid in Jenin. The conflict has resulted in significant casualties and displacement in Gaza, with hospitals under blockade and allegations of Hamas using civilian buildings for cover. International mediation has so far failed to secure a ceasefire. U.S. National Security Advisor Sullivan met Israel's gallant again, White House says. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan held talks with Israeli Defense Minister Yov Gallant for a second day, urging Israel to refrain from launching a ground offensive in Rafah, Gaza. 
This comes after Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu blocked a delegation from meeting American counterparts following the U.S.'s abstention from a U.N. resolution calling for a Gaza ceasefire. President Joe Biden aims to prevent civilian casualties and address humanitarian concerns in Rafah, where half of Gaza's population is concentrated. Despite reaffirming U.S. support for Israel, the Biden administration emphasizes the need for Israel to expand humanitarian aid into Gaza and conduct operations with precision to protect civilians. Negotiations for a ceasefire and the release of hostages held by Hamas are ongoing, with some progress reported recently. Palestinian Authority announces a new cabinet as it faces calls for reform. The Palestinian Authority, PA, has announced the formation of a new cabinet, led by President Mahmoud Abbas, amid international pressure for reform. The new government, formed by Prime Minister Mohammad Mustafa, consists of mostly unfamiliar figures, with Mustafa also serving as foreign minister. Ziad Hab al Rih retains his position as interior minister, overseeing security forces, while Ashraf al Awar becomes the Minister for Jerusalem Affairs. Notably, five of the 23 ministers are from Gaza, although it's uncertain if they currently reside there. The PA, governing parts of the West Bank, lacks popularity due to its prolonged absence of elections and cooperation with Israel, seen by many as tacitly supporting the occupation. The United States has urged a revitalized PA to manage post-war Gaza, but Israel opposes this, preferring to maintain security control. Meanwhile, Hamas rejects the new government. Advocating for a power-sharing arrangement involving all Palestinian factions ahead of national elections and warning against cooperation with Israel. Israel politics trigger Democrats to withdraw support from sexual violence bill. Several House Democrats withdrew their support for legislation condemning sexual violence after controversial language regarding Israel was added to the bill. Despite claims of being unaware of the changes, an email obtained by The Hill showed that lawmakers were notified two weeks before the bill's introduction and given the opportunity to remove their names. The amended text of the resolution referenced reported. Harassment of Palestinian women and Israel's conflict with Hamas. Lawmakers who withdrew their support cited concerns about false equivalencies between Israel and Hamas and unsubstantiated claims. The resolution sponsor, Rep. Debbie Dingell, emphasized the seriousness of the subject and the need for accurate resolutions. The withdrawal of support coincided with broader tensions surrounding the U.S. government's handling of the Israel-Hamas conflict, particularly regarding reports of sexual violence. Additionally, the government funding bill signed by President Biden included security assistance for Israel and blocked U.S. contributions to the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees, UNRWA. UN experts have called for arms exports to Israel to cease amid concerns about their use in violating international humanitarian law. Lebanon's Hezbollah says it launched dozens of rockets after Israeli strikes. Hezbollah, a Lebanese militant group, launched dozens of rockets at Kiryat Shmona, an Israeli town, in response to deadly Israeli airstrikes on the village of Hebria in southern Lebanon. The exchange of fire escalated tensions between Israel and Hezbollah, with both sides expressing reluctance for all-out war but continuing strikes. Israeli airstrikes in Lebanon killed several Hezbollah fighters, while a rocket strike in Kiryat Shmona resulted in the death of a factory worker. The conflict has spilled beyond Gaza, where it initially erupted, with the Israeli military increasing readiness for potential escalation along the northern border with Lebanon. Additionally, Yemen's Houthi rebels have been attacking ships in the Red Sea, and armed groups in Iraq with ties to Iran have targeted bases hosting U.S. forces. Airstrikes in Syria kill an Iranian advisor and a member of a World Health Organization team. A series of airstrikes in eastern Syria's Deir el-Zur province killed more than a dozen people, including an Iranian military advisor and a World Health Organization team member. The strikes targeted areas including the provincial capital, Deir el-Zur, as well as Mayadeen and Bukamal. Among the casualties were nine Iraqi fighters from an Iran-backed group and two Syrians working with the Iranians. The World Health Organization confirmed the death of engineer Ahmad Shahab, who served as a focal point for water, sanitation, and hygiene. While no one has claimed responsibility for the strikes, Israel is known to frequently target Iran-linked sites in Syria. Additionally, in Lebanon, an Israeli airstrike was reported in the village of Zbaud in the Hummel region, targeting a military complex used by Hezbollah. 
This strike was allegedly in retaliation for Hezbollah's missile attack on Mount Maron air traffic control base in northern Israel earlier that day. Putin says Russia will not attack NATO, but F-16s will be shot down in Ukraine. Russian President Vladimir Putin stated that Russia has no intentions of attacking NATO countries such as Poland, the Baltic states, or the Czech Republic. However, he warned that if the West supplies F-16 fighters to Ukraine, Russian forces will shoot them down. Putin emphasized that the deployment of F-16s would not alter the situation in Ukraine and asserted that Russia would treat these aircraft as legitimate targets, even if they were based in third countries. His remarks came amid escalating tensions between Russia and the West over the conflict in Ukraine, with Ukraine expecting F-16 deliveries in the coming months. Several NATO countries have pledged to donate F-16s and assist in training Ukrainian pilots. Ukraine Foreign Minister arrives in New Delhi to boost ties with India, a historical ally of Russia. Ukraine's Foreign Minister Dmitro Kuleba has arrived in New Delhi for a two-day visit aimed at strengthening bilateral ties and cooperation with India. During his visit, Kuleba is scheduled to meet with Indian Foreign Minister Subrahmanyam Jaishankar and other officials. He will also pay respects to Mahatma Gandhi at the Rajhat Memorial site. The visit comes after Prime Minister Narendra Modi's. Recent conversations with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky and Russian President Vladimir Putin, where India reiterated its support for peace efforts in Ukraine without criticizing Russia. Modi emphasized the importance of dialogue and peace in resolving the conflict. India has positioned itself as a mediator between the West and Russia and has expressed interest in participating in peace initiatives, including the peace summit proposed by Switzerland. Despite refraining from voting against Moscow at the United Nations, India has increased engagements with Western powers and reduced dependence on Russian arms and technology due to disruptions caused by the war. Ukraine has welcomed India's efforts to help end Russia's invasion. NATO discusses plans to shoot down Russian missiles if they approach alliance borders. NATO is reportedly discussing plans to shoot down Russian missiles if they approach the alliance's borders, according to Poland's deputy foreign minister, Andrzej Sejna. The discussion follows an incident where a Russian cruise missile crossed into Polish airspace for 39 seconds. Poland's defense ministry activated air defense systems and NATO F-16 fighter jets in response. While one defensive option is to intercept missiles before they enter NATO airspace, such actions could provoke escalation. Despite previous incidents, NATO has not responded with military force. However, the United States reaffirmed its commitment to defending NATO allies in case of an attack. Germany to speed up arms purchases in defense industry shakeup. Germany plans to streamline the approval process for weapons purchases and provide more certainty for large arms contracts in response to the changing global threat landscape following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Economy Minister Robert Habeck emphasized the need to bolster the country's security capabilities amidst the current threatening background. The return of war to European soil has prompted Germany to reassess its defense. Approach and increase spending, with Berlin being a major supporter of Ukraine. However, there is internal debate within the ruling coalition regarding the supply of long-range Taurus missiles. While Chancellor Olaf Scholz has expressed concerns about involvement in the conflict, other government members support providing the missiles. To facilitate military modernization, a 100 billion euro special fund was established, with most of the budget already allocated. The government aims to expedite approval processes for weapons purchases and revise regulations for dual-use goods. Habeck also called for the creation of a European Union Commissioner for Defense to coordinate a common procurement market in the bloc. Colombia expels Argentine diplomats after Miley calls Petro terrorist. Colombia has ordered the expulsion of Argentine diplomats from their embassy in response to what it deems denigrating comments made by Argentine President Javier Miley about Colombian President Gustavo Petro. In an unreleased interview with CNN, Miley reportedly referred to Petro as a terrorist, murderer, and communist. Colombia's foreign ministry stated that Miley's remarks have damaged trust between the two nations and offended the dignity of President Petro, who was democratically elected. This move comes after Colombia recalled its ambassador to Argentina in January following similar comments from Miley. Petro, Colombia's first leftist president, has a history with the M-19 guerrilla movement. Miley, a libertarian, also criticized other regional leaders during the interview, including Mexico's Andres Manuel López Obrador. 
Philippines up stakes in China row, vows countermeasures to Coast Guard attacks. President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. of the Philippines has announced plans to implement countermeasures against what he describes as illegal, coercive, aggressive, and dangerous attacks by China's Coast Guard in the South China Sea. The escalation in tensions between the two countries comes as Marcos seeks to deepen defense ties with the United States, frustrating Beijing. China blames the Philippines for the breakdown in relations and warns against provocative actions. Despite China's warning, Marcos asserts that the Philippines will seek to protect its sovereignty with the help of international allies. As both countries take steps to defend their positions, tensions in the region continue to rise. Japan's leader seeks a meeting with North Korea and an end to deflation, to boost public support. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida reiterated his commitment to working towards a summit with North Korea's Kim Jong-un to address the abduction issue of Japanese citizens by North Korean agents in the 1970s and 80s. Despite recent comments from North Korea suggesting conditions for such a meeting, Kishida remains determined. He emphasized his involvement in high-level negotiations to address various bilateral issues, including concerns about North Korea's missiles and nuclear weapons programs. Kishida also outlined his plans to combat decades-long deflation in Japan through economic reforms under his New Capitalism program, aiming for higher wages, company profits, and productivity. Additionally, he addressed a political funding scandal within his party, promising internal investigations and legal revisions to restore public trust. Despite a decline in his popularity, Kishida's Potential ouster is unlikely to result in significant political change, with another leader from the ruling Liberal Democratic Party expected to take his place. There's speculation, including the possibility of Japan's first female prime minister, such as Tokyo Governor Yuriko Koike, though she would need to run for a parliamentary seat to assume the role. Putin's spy chief visited North Korea, Russian intelligence service says. Sergei Naryshkin, the head of Russia's Foreign Intelligence Service, SVR, visited North Korea to enhance bilateral cooperation and discuss regional security. During his visit, Naryshkin met with North Korean Minister of State Security Ri Chang Dae to address international developments, regional security, and deepening Russian-North Korean ties. Both sides emphasized the need to counter external pressure and espionage. Activities Putin's administration has strengthened relations with North Korea since the 2022 Ukraine invasion, despite criticism from the US and its allies regarding alleged missile deliveries. However, Russia and North Korea have dismissed these accusations, asserting their right to engage in bilateral cooperation. In February, Putin gifted North Korean leader Kim Jong-un a luxury Russian Oris limousine. Additionally, a North Korean delegation visited Vietnam to discuss enhancing cooperation and improving relations. These diplomatic engagements reflect Pyongyang's efforts to expand its ties following COVID-19 lockdowns. New Zealand expects China's respect as it explores joining AUKUS. New Zealand's Foreign Minister Winston Peters affirmed the country's intention to join the AUKUS Security Pact while maintaining an independent foreign policy and a strong relationship with China. Despite China's expressed concerns about New Zealand's involvement in AUKUS, Peters does not anticipate economic coercion from Beijing. New Zealand, a nuclear-free nation, is interested in Pillar 2 of the AUKUS Pact. Focusing on cooperation in areas such as quantum computing and artificial intelligence. Peters aims to strengthen ties with traditional Western partners while preserving trade relations with China, the country's largest export customer. He emphasized New Zealand's commitment to democracy, the rule of law, and international agreements like UNCLOS regarding territorial disputes in the South China Sea. Peters highlighted New Zealand's special connection with China but stressed the country's independent foreign policy. He also acknowledged China's increased engagement in the South Pacific region, filling a void left by other nations. However, Peters welcomed recent efforts by the U.S. to broaden its presence in the Pacific. While fostering connections with the U.S., Peters declined to express a preference for the outcome of the approaching U.S. presidential election.